Hello, I'm Peter Woodbury with Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. And today we have the honor of having Dr. Jason Parker with us to interview. He's going to be teaching a course in March of 2018, his Introduction to Hypnosis class. I've also had the honor of teaching with him. He's a gifted teacher and hypnotist, hypnotherapist, lecturer. He um, has his PhD from Virginia Tech. And so you won't want to miss this enlightening interview today. All right, so here we are with uh, Dr. Jason uh, Parker. And, Hello. Uh, you're Call going to be um, leading another hypnotherapy training yeah, in this March. Is... Should we start there, telling us about that? Yeah, we have our foundations in hypnosis, and this is like really exciting because we're starting this in March. And I say this is really exciting because this is our second round where we are actually here at the ARE running our, our, our full hypnosis program. Mm -hmm. And we actually put it together and we ran through, we have a foundations program, we have an intermediate program, we have more of a combined advanced program. Plus I know you do your uh, regression mm -hmm. and you have a secondary regression one. When you put those together, what we're looking at are five different trainings uh, put together with hypnosis from that perspective of Casey and Casey's readings, but also working in a scientific perspective. So it's that blend of scientific and spiritual. And I think when we start mixing those two together, we start getting something really, really powerful. But yeah, this um, upcoming um, spring in March uh, 2018, we're going to be looking at the foundations, which really is exactly what that title is, is that basic foundation of what hypnosis is, uh, what the brain does with hypnosis, its history, mm -hmm. and then starting how we can apply that not only to your business, but also into your day-to-day -day lives. Yeah. And I find that to me really interesting because I think a lot of people don't understand what hypnosis is. Well, if you, I mean, both of us uh, work with hypnosis. How yeah. do you, how do you, what's your uh, little simple explanation of what hypnosis is or what it isn't? Yeah, well, whenever you're in an altered state, we're open to suggestion. It's something as basic as that. Mm -hmm. So anytime you are not in that kind of centered, focused, here statement, that's mm -hmm. part of just being, you know, mm -hmm. just being here. When you get beyond that, in either direction, you become open to suggestion. That means when we're really happy, we're suggestible. And I see this a lot. I love this. People go, well, I'm doing great on my diet. You know, and they're, 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 they've decided they're going on blank diet and they're cutting out these foods and eating these other foods and they're doing great. Or, and, or they're going, I'm going to give up drinking and they've given up drinking and they're doing great. But then they go to a party and they don't expect this. Mm -hmm. They go, you know, a sports event, a football game, and everybody's laughing and everybody's happy. What they don't realize is laughing, happy, and being excited is an altered state. And then somebody mm -hmm. goes, let's order a pizza. And your diet goes <laughs> right out the window because you take that suggestion. Mm -hmm. So everybody sees on TV with hypnosis being this weird, spinny-eyed trance. But it really is much more of a normal thing we flow in and out of. So anytime we hit that altered state, we become open to suggestions. Same thing when people are really sad. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this. Um, if you've ever had a family member pass, they all, you know, they, you're always here. Don't make any big decisions. Don't sign any papers. Mm -hmm. You go to the dentist. They tell you after having nitrous oxide, don't make any big decisions today. Don't sign any papers because you're in an altered state and you're suggestible. So people will just follow that suggestion. Um, the difference is when we do this as teaching hypnosis, when you do it for personal growth, you're putting yourself in an altered state. But instead of being really you know, elated or really sad or really angry, if you've ever, ever been around somebody when they're really, really mad and you go, hey, why don't you just punch your, your fist through that glass wall? And you'll watch them put their hand through a car windshield. And they're like, well, that was dumb. Mm. But they'll follow that suggestion. But mm. when we do personal work, we put yourself into a relaxed state. You know, that almost, that's where you kind of almost shoot for that kind of zenish type state mm. where you're calm, happy, 
but so relaxed that you're altered. Mm -hmm. And what that does when you put yourself into that altered state, because you could do it in anything, but to do it in a calm state, it puts you in a controlled state. And from there, you can give yourself any suggestion needed. What I've always found fascinating, because I've been in the teaching world since um, I, I graduated high school. I went right in like many people. I started teaching swimming at a YMCA. Mm -hmm. And many people started off their teaching careers by teaching kids and, you know, and, and teaching at those lower levels. So I spent my whole time as an adult working on communicating and teaching. And it's so much getting a person into that point where they can learn. But what I think is fascinating, the one thing we don't teach people, you go through school, elementary school, high school, you hear about health, but they don't teach you about mental health. Mm. And when I get down to explaining what hypnosis is, right now, while I am talking to you, I guarantee you, you have a voice in your head it's making a running commentary on everything that I'm saying. Now, when I explain this to people, the next the thought is, okay, how does he know I have a voice? Well, we all do. It's called your operator voice. Mm -hmm. um, Bandura actually called it the inner autobiographer. And it's that inner voice that gives you your daily history. It's who the I is. When we learn as children how to uh, speak, we first speak out loud. And if you watch a four or a five-year-old, their thoughts and their words are the same. So they, 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 in their play, they will be going, well, this little car goes over here, and this guy goes over here, and their thoughts are their speech. And that's why they talk about how children are so honest, because you ask them any question, and they will just blurt it out. Now, around the age of five or six, that voice, though, becomes internalized, and it becomes our inner companion. Mm -hmm. So we all have this inner operator voice. But what has always amazed me is we don't teach people about that voice or that that inner voice can be controlled. So when I start talking to people about hypnosis, I ask them, are you your own best friend? Are you your own best teacher? Are you your own best parent? Is your mm -hmm. inner voice your best companion? Or yeah, is it your sad. greatest adversary? It's sad how oftentimes that's not the case. That I've, Sometimes I'll tell people that when they express their inner voice, I'll say, boy, if that was a person, I'd have them arrested. Yeah. Like they would never talk to somebody else that way. Yeah. The way yeah. they talk to themselves. Yeah. And this is where psychology suddenly gets simple. I think we can oversimplify human behavior in many ways. Mm -hmm. People, in an oversimplification, if you have issues with anxiety, the inner voice is going, watch out for tomorrow. Watch out, watch out, be careful, watch out. People who, who are very, very sad, their inner voice is going, well, this is awful, this is awful, it went wrong today, it's gonna go wrong tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And maybe, part of just being more productive and happier as an individual is learning to control that voice so that it is your best coach. Mm -hmm. You know, is your inner voice going, well, we can do this. Well, I can do this. So will that be a focus of the course, just kind of uh, teaching the students how to help clients kind of learn to have a healthier inner voice? First off, that's teaching the self to mm -hmm. have, a, have an inner voice and how that works. Mm -hmm. And I think one of my favorite definitions I heard of what hypnosis is, is hypnosis is the controlled use of language. Being aware of what you say and being aware of your body's emotional state. Mm. Altered state, open to suggestion. Suggestion comes from your inner voice. So once you learn to become aware of those two things, then you start questioning, where am I getting my own suggestions on my behavior? Where am I getting my own self-teaching? So altered state, open to suggestion. The suggestions come from your inner voice. And this is one of the first lessons in hypnosis. When you add those two together, one of the things you realize is all hypnosis, no matter who is doing it, is self-hypnosis. Mm -hmm. One person has never 
hypnotized another person. And I think that's the biggest misunderstanding out there mm -hmm. is they think that one person hypnotizes another, but they don't. Yeah. The elegance in a good hypnotist. Well, I think uh, most people get introduced to hypnosis like on YouTube. Yes. And they'll see a stage hypnotist working with highly suggestible, like they've called the audience. Up. And so they yeah. think that that's, that's what hypnosis is, or that's really just kind of a working with like culling a group down to the most suggestible individual. Well, they, yeah, they find the most suggestible people and they bring them up, but the moment they get on stage they are nervous or they're excited, so mm -hmm. they're in an altered yeah. state. And right off they're suggestible. And I've always had such strong feelings about and mixed feelings about stage hypnotism. Yeah. Because with stage hypnotism, yes, it entertains. Yeah. It also frightens individuals. And it's amazing to me the number of people who when they first see me and they go, oh, you do hypnosis. Are you gonna make me quack like a duck? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know. Do you really need hypnosis for you to make a, you know, a fool out of yourself? Because many people when it get a chance to get on stage are more than happy to do something silly. But in real life, it doesn't really work that way. So, and it amazes me because people go, well, if you're thinking you'll, you, with hypnosis, you'll do something embarrassing, well, why don't we do something that'll help you? Mm -hmm. Something that will give you a feeling of personal control or a yeah. feeling of, of self-worth or a feeling of self-esteem. So with that altered state, that openness to suggestion and that using one's inner voice as your helper and realizing that with your controlled language, you work that way with other people, then you start opening the world up to creating that future in that world that you want to have. And I think one of the main things in the first things you learn with foundations and hypnosis is hypnosis can be used for suggestion, but suggestion is just a fancy word for learning. Mm. So you can use hypnosis to learn and to learn information rapidly and to set forth who you want to be. Now, one of the things I've been like following is, um, you know, the placebo effect, which is mm -hmm. really, uh, you know, a suggestible yeah. influence or suggestible uh, state. That, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, the placebo effect used to be 30 percent, and I've always wondered why they didn't study it more. Like the, you know, science is always trying to get rid of the placebo effect, it? and recently it's as high as 50%. So it's like uh, suggestibility or faith or whatever you want to call it seems to be growing. Like more and more people are open yeah. to suggestion. Like the, the pharmaceutical companies hate it because now they, to get a drug on the market, they have to outperform the placebo and the placebo keeps getting stronger. Right, right. So it's interesting. In, in some ways I think that I wonder if faith is growing. I know the, the work that I've been doing, it seems that um, it's easier for people to access deeper states of consciousness. Like it's almost like every day there's like a thinning of the veil and more and more people are, are opening to that. So it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, a fun time to be doing this kind of work. It is, and I've always thought that it's, you know, it's a shame that hypnosis has been kind of the whipping boy of science for the last mm -hmm. 150 years. Because when you look at it, the thing is with the placebo effect is the placebo effect is still an effect. Mm -hmm. And it is a powerful effect, and you're right, for the recommendation of anything to be scientific and not just by random chance, it has to outperform the placebo. Yes. But when the placebo starts being more effective, because that's what suggestion does, you yeah. take a placebo effect, right. and now you give a suggestion on top of it, right. well now it becomes more and more effective. Right. One of the, uh, the American Medical Association, excuse me, the APAs, the American Psychology Association's Manual on Hypnosis, and I make this sign because the book's about this big, mm -hmm. talks about how for smoking cessation, which is any smoking behavior for mm -hmm. that behavioral change, hypnosis is 70 to 75 percent effective. Wow, that's great. There are, so, mm -hmm. there, there are very few drugs on the market. <laughs> For an right. antibiotic, right? That are that <laughs> That's effective. that effective. Yeah. It's so much more effective by adding in both uh, suggestion on top of placebo plus expectancy, because there's mm -hmm. an expectancy yes. effect as well, and that is 20 to 30 percent effective mm -hmm. as well. So they're coming in with an expectancy of change, mm -hmm. and now you're giving them the 
placebo, uh, which is any behavior for change, plus suggestion for change. And then suddenly you have a real powerful effect. Yeah, you know, Casey um, talked about um, any time you get any kind of treatment or you do exercise yeah. to, to augment it with, he said, see and feel this medication or this treatment or whatever you're yeah. doing, see and feel it working. So it's almost like encouraging us to, you know, when we take our, I don't know, vitamin pill or when we take mm -hmm. our Jerusalem artichoke, that we, we, we convince ourselves and see it working in our body. A guy named Roland, this is an old research study, mm -hmm. a guy named Roland, I think it was 1988, did a study and it was CAT scan study where he looked at the difference between visualization, creating a picture in your head and actually seeing the object. And they looked at it, and so what they're looking at with this CAT scan is basic, it, it, to really break down in this most basic term, they're looking at ox oxygen absorption in the mm -hmm. brain. What part of the brain is active when you're doing these things. And what his study showed was that if you look at an object, you look at an orange, your brain lights up in the occipital right. areas and it locks yeah. up a little bit in the frontal areas as it goes for that object identification. Well, if you close your eyes and visualize it, the brain lights up in, in the, the exact way. same yeah. way. So yeah. the difference between visualizing and seeing is, is, is almost non-existent. Oh, yeah. If you picture it. The imaginative forces, as Casey would your, call it. Your brain has done yeah. it. Yeah, imagine if your brain has done it, which is mm -hmm. funny because, you know, that is kind of the message um, on the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. Don't just not do these things. Don't think about right. them either because yeah. the brain responds the same. Now, how just going back in your... Your rich, uh, I know a little bit about your rich history, but how did it remind us about where, how did you get into hypnosis? What were the, what were, what were the uh, events that led to, to you following that path? That is, well, like so many people, I got introduced to hypnosis actually by my mom who wanted me to study better. Oh. I was so worried about, you know, my performance in school way back when I was in middle school, maybe high school, I got a cassette tape on learning and memory, and mm. improving your learning and memory. And one of the things, and it was like, well, just listen to this tape at night and fall asleep to it. Well, it's funny, because I still to this day can't tell you what's on that tape, because it starts off with this whole metaphor of imagining you're on a big balloon ride. Mm -hmm. Now cut one string and begin floating and lifting off, and another, and begin floating and lifting off, and well, then I'd wake up the next morning. So I found mm -hmm. out, one, I, myself, I am a high hypnotizable. Mm -hmm. So I have started finding out the benefits of that So you started on. doing better in school? Yeah, actually, yeah. it did help yeah. with memory and helped me remembering okay. finite things. And yeah. that is kind of the joke right now, is I can remember the mo my, most minute details, but I can't remember where I'm supposed to be in an hour. But I can tell <laughs> you the details of my history, because mm -hmm. I get those down. And that's kind of where it started. But when I started studying psychology, I was always interested in the old psychology. And what I think people don't realize is everybody's heard of Freud, but before Freud was Mesmer. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Freud's lineage, it does go back to Mesmer. And Mesmer actually was trained by a priest, a guy named Hell or Heel. Mm -hmm. And so it all comes from that learning and that understanding of the mind and the power of creation and creative forces coming through the individual and through the mind. And I think exploring consciousness. And what I found with hypnosis is the ability to explore consciousness, but also to me was always learning to control that inner voice, that, that, that ability to coach oneself and help oneself get better. And for me, my road into hypnosis was really fascinating in that I just took a weekend course on it. It was, I think, a four day long course mm -hmm. in hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And after there, now I've got a master's degree in psychology at this point, so I've got training. Mm -hmm. And I got a certificate in hypnosis. Well, I go to my family doctor and I go, well, you know, if you ever know, any, you know anybody wants to lose weight or smoking, why don't you, you know, contact me, maybe, you know, we'll set something up. He said, come in on Monday. Well, it turns out there was an internship open there, a uh, 
clinician had just left and left an entire practice at this medical practice. Wow. So the doctor goes, oh, by the way, here's your charts. <laughs> Congratulations. You're, you know, you, and, didn't know and you were hired huh? right there. You're hired. Uh -huh. And hypnosis was the tool I had. And the hypnosis is what I started working at, which suggestion, you know, can help change and modify behavior and change and modify behavior. It can help build self-esteem. It can help change bad mm -hmm. habits. It can help you, you know, with weight loss. It can help you with stress. But stress is where I started getting really interested in that got me interested in one of the things that you do which is regression mm. so almost a question back how did you get interested in regression how did that happen yeah how did that um, happen well my father um, was a psychoanalyst okay and so he had played around with uh, hypnosis uh, growing up he had a story of hypnotizing a maid to pull the beard of an honored guest at dinner, and she okay. did it. Okay. And so he had he had party tricks, but he didn't. Um, he personally didn't follow it as uh, in his practice. But I remember I'd heard about it through him, and then um, you know, with when I got my degree in social work, you have to do continuing education, mm -hmm. and I've always uh, tried to to learn uh, a complete new subject rather than just do a little day long course. Yeah. So I. I was curious about uh, hypnosis, and when I was in Boston, there was a well-known hypnotherapist named Dan Brown, uh, mm -hmm. PhD, and not the author, but uh, or he's an author, but he's not the right. not the lost symbol author. Uh, I guess he goes by Daniel Brown, and um, I started taking some of his classes, and uh, one thing led to another. When I moved here, I was the conference facilitator, so I sat in on about four or five of the Chips's course, mm -hmm. and then eventually started incorporating uh, regression into my hypnotherapy practice and then that I started just seeing uh, how effective it was but I, I remember when I first started I didn't really like it and I was thinking God it's so effective it's helping people so much why don't I like it and I realized because in my psychotherapy practice I could take ownership of the changes mm -hmm. like I felt it was I had to think I was you know clients are talking I'm using all my education yeah. and then when I was doing regression I'm just like a, I call myself a Sherpa I just give them suggestions they have these fantastic experiences they thank me but I feel like I didn't do anything I just took you there so so I realized that it's really egoless work mm -hmm. and in that and, and I think that that's part of its power is that it's it's transcendent like yeah. it's it's it you as a I mean you, you may learn different skills the longer you do it the more you can handle a range of situations mm -hmm. but it's like I tell the students just get out of the way trust the process let it happen yeah. amplify watch what happens you're working with guides they'll take care of things and then just make sure people come back and surround yourself in prayer and, and you'll be okay I love the richness in the stories because oh, that yeah. to me is one of the joys of being a yes. therapist that uses hypnosis is when you go into a regression, it's a very simple thing of you know suggesting to the person to go to the cause of the problem mm -hmm. or to go to the beginning yes. of this issue or go to the beginning of the story. And from there, and then you the just see richness of the yeah. story that comes Yeah, no out. two sessions are ever the same. And it allows me just actually to listen to these wonderful, rich experiences that people have. Well, it's like, you know, uh, what I feel with regression is that, you know, we all know history in a broad mm -hmm. brush sort of way, yeah. but I feel with regression, I get to know, like, I remember one woman was working at the library in Alexandria when it burnt. Okay. And it was this one person's view of, you know, her experience. Like, what, what she took from that into this life is that she said, never trust books, never trust mm -hmm. anything that, that can be lost. It's all mm -hmm. have to, you have to keep it in your own mind or share it orally, but don't, you know, she had kept that imprint of having lost the, li the great library Everything. of Alexandria. Yeah. Oh. So it's, it's those little, like, like um, you know, a priestess in Atlantis. Yes. You know, that little glimpse, you know, what it was like when there was the, the battling between the light and, uh, light and mm -hmm. dark forces. So I, I, I like getting the, the little details, you know, the, the, the little person that was involved in some big part of history, but they were just like the, the gatekeeper or something like that. I love asking little questions when they do that because what's always fascinated me, one of the things that really drove me into hypnosis is the weird stuff. Mm -hmm. I find exploring past lives to be fascinating mm -hmm. because of the richness of the stories, the 
intricacies that people get. And these are the same people, if you ask them, well, how'd you do in history in high school? They go, well, I didn't do well at all. You know, they, did, they don't have that, inf but mm -hmm. when they start doing the regression, they have all this information. I love asking little questions like, well, where's the light coming from? Well, for me, and it also helps like how people have, um, you know, patterns that they feel like yeah. they're stuck in. Show up and it over helps to and see that, over and that don't over. worry, you've been working with this pattern for lifetimes. It's deeply mm -hmm. entrenched. So that helps you feel like, like you're just trying to make progress sometimes on yeah. deeply entrenched patterns. Yeah. Well, people always ask me, is it real or is it made up? Mm. And this is the explanation that I get, and I'd love to hear yeah, your I'll thoughts. Yeah, I'll tell you mine. Because my explanation, is it real or is it not? Well, Edgar Cayce says that we have sojourns. Mm -hmm. And we are born into this life in sojourns, and we have a soul group. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll try to explain soul groups. Are, you know, your family is a soul group. Yeah. But also those people you work with at your office, well, that's a soul group too. Yeah. Sports teams. You have, you know, you're playing, yes. on, you, you play, you play even as an adult. They were probably you play gladiators or something. Right. They yeah. were all part of the same the team and part of the same soul group. Well, Casey says we're born into these soul groups and then, you know, we, we come in and we have the physical life and then we leave where we look at what's happened in our lifetime and what can we learn from it? We're on this path of learning. Then we go back into another soldier and we interact with people and, you know, achievements and failed achievements, and then we have a chance to learn from that and back in. And what happens, at least from that Casey perspective, is our life and our soul's journey is a life and a journey of learning as we move towards perfection. Mm -hmm. Now, that's fine for people who are open to the idea of past lives. What about people who are not open to them? Well, I say, well, you know, if you look at it from a Jungian perspective, because from Jung, if you look at it from his perspective, Jung was, of course, one of the people who was trained by Freud mm -hmm. and one of Freud's contemporaries. Well, Carl Jung talks about symbology. And maybe it's easier for us to look at the patterns in our lifetime that we want to change by putting them in this periodic story. We make mom and dad kings and queens. And we look at it from a symbolic realm but as we look at our life from this symbolic story, we go through that whole story of that life and that time period from the symbolic, and then we reflect on that to see what we can learn from it. And then you look at another lifetime, and it's another symbolic telling of, your, of, of this issue in your life. Mm -hmm. And you look at it on how you can grow and how you can mature and become a better person from it. Well, the beauty of this is whether it's real or a part of your subconscious, the end point is the same. What does this tell you about you? And how can you better yourself from that? And the thing that I love is we really won't know if these past life memories are real or not until we're dead. And you know, at that point, we won't care. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, we're finding so much more about how you know what we consider reality it's all it's so consciousness based you know like what's what's what we consider real in this state of awareness let's say mm -hmm. we go to a dream well from here we don't think that's real but in the dream that's real or if you're in these in-between states mm -hmm. you might think of this you know this is the illusion and then that be, so it's all to me the word reality is just be it's almost um, there's there's we multiple realities but I, when, when I'm asked that question about is it real or is it imaginative, I, uh, my answer is I'm much more interested in is it helpful. Yeah. And like you were saying that a dream, maybe we don't think of a dream as real, but dreams can be incredibly helpful. Yeah. And well, a past but, life memory, is it real? I've had uh, people maybe don't believe in past lives. They get something that sounds like a past life, yeah. but it liberates them yes. of a pattern in this experience, so yeah. so to me that because I, I just stick with, is it helpful? And yeah. I and I find that whatever realm of consciousness it's coming from, my experience has been that that it's generally very very helpful. Well, here's the thing: is it a dream or is it real? And I think people forget how real dreams can be. Mm -hmm. And I always ask, I ask my students this question. It's one of my favorite questions to ask students. Have you ever had a dream where your partner in life 
in your dream last night when you were sleeping did something you didn't want them to do. Your partner was maybe with another person in the dream. And you wake up the next day and I always ask them, well, how do you treat your partner the next day? They go, well, I'm mad at them. Have you ever had that experience where you're mad course, at your partner yeah. because of what they did in your dreams last night? Right. And you still might go, I know it was just a dream, real. but I'm still mad at you about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because it goes back to that imaging in the brain. If the brain thinks it's real, it is real. Yeah. So it goes back to that believing and seeing. Well, that is, it becomes a hurdle for some people about wrestling with whether it's real or imaginative. And I, I like how Carl Jung, he just t called yeah. this work, even though he personally believed in reincarnation, he would call it creative imagination. So that he would, that way you don't have to deal with that. I said, oh, whatever it is, we're just gonna, you're gonna let your subconscious yeah. play and it's gonna create a story and oftentimes those stories are helpful. And I'm sure he believed sometimes they were mm -hmm. tapping into past lives, yeah. but they were just thinking, oh, that's an interesting, fable or story or fantasy that I made up with with rich, like a dream, with rich yeah. uh, elements to interpret and apply in life. It's still what can life. we learn from this. Yes. What I like is uh, one of the things I was exposed to, because and, 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 I go to a lot of conferences and trainings, is I was exposed from a, 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 a medicine man. And this is one of the times I think I have, I've never felt stupider in my life. Because I met this medicine man, and he was a Navajo medicine man. And I said, well, you know, because he's here on the East Coast, well, what do you do, uh, you know, when you're back on the reservation, medicine man? No, what do you do for a living, medicine man? <laughs> no, what are you as a career? <laughs> medicine man. I'm like, oh, right, okay, 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 okay. It's like I'm so stuck in my Western thought. Okay. Well, one of the things that he pointed out to me, which has always made me think, is he said in his perspective, we have two realities that we live in every day the reality of our physical world and the reality of our dream world. But the dream world is also a reality. And I'm sure there's always, there's been moments in life where my dream world is so yeah. rich, I look forward to getting home, yeah. to being done with the day, because I would like to go back to this dream world because it has been so rich and so productive that that reality is meaningful mm -hmm. and then from the creation and the understanding of that dream world I begin to be able to reflect back and this gets into Carl Jung and Freud mm -hmm. as well to reflect back and Erickson on my current life what my dream world is telling me yeah and then to jump from this whole spiritual type existence of, of dream world as a reality and the physical world as a reality when we jump into neurosciences this is where I have fun and foundations is mm -hmm. like let's talk about all these these things that are out here in the spiritual and the ethereal and in, in the Casey world but now let's look at the brain well your left brain is your logical brain globally and your right brain is kind of that emotional symbolic brain mm -hmm. And during our day, and with hypnosis, that inner voice mm -hmm. is all on the left logical side. Yes. So the left brain is almost dictating to the rest of you mm -hmm. how you should think. Mm -hmm. But at night, the left brain sleeps, right. and the right brain talks, but the right brain Dreams. talks in pictures and yeah. symbols, which is its language. And here's the thing I try to let people understand is, once you realize you have two brains, and one talks more at night, one talks at day, when you get the two to communicate so that your logical self and your emotional self are now combined in saying the same thing. You have a powerful thing happening there. Because at that point, when it comes to your life goals, nothing can get in your way. When it comes to your, your left and your right brain communicating, no one can really trick you or manipulate you either. Because, you know, if you're talking to a salesman and they're selling you a bad car, your stomach will be going, oh, something's wrong with this. And that's your right brain going, I don't like it. But Carl Jung talked about how the right brain can even be intuitive and predict and tell you what's going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it neurologically, there's no magic to that kind of clairvoyancy. Your right brain, just like your left brain, can take all the logical things that are happening and go, well, there were trees in front of me, there's trees behind me, but the forest is getting thicker. So tomorrow it will be even thicker. Mm -hmm. Or it's turning more into heading into the city. 
tomorrow will be more of that. The right brain just takes all of those pictures of your day-to-day -day life and can make a prediction about what's happening next. So suddenly, that ethereal dream world is a product of your right brain. So it's not some mysterious subconscious, it's the other half of you. Mm -hmm. So what we're also teaching is how can you get control of and become friends with the other half of you? Because mm -hmm. it's yeah, powerful. Yeah, I oftentimes describe it that way, that, that because at the beginning of a regression, the, the, a person is, it's almost like they're at a movie and mm -hmm. someone is telling them, oh, this is so fake, yeah. this isn't, and then it's like, that's the right brain trying to keep them on this side of the mm -hmm. bridge yeah. as they're trying to cross into the right brain. And so I tell them, just like you do at a movie, you have to say, quiet down, let me enjoy the movie, like suspend your disbelief. Mm -hmm. And then you can cross into the creative, imaginative, you know, yeah. pink butterflies yeah. or whatever. Well, flying. a good hypnotic suggestion is when your left brain that brought you in, is what mm -hmm. I want to change, your right brain goes, okay, we're going to change it. And this is one of my favorite cases. I had a lady come in who wanted to quit smoking. She's pregnant. Mm -hmm. It's their second baby, and she knows the dangers of cigarettes, so she wants to quit smoking. So I gave her a simple suggestion. If you're ever around cigarette smoke, the smell of smoke alone, this is, this is just so fun, your morning sickness will be 10 times worse if you're around cigarette smoke. Your morning sickness, your nausea will be 10 times worse. Or her left brain's going, well, I gotta quit smoking. Your right brain goes, I can do nausea. 10 times can, worse. 10 times worse. And what I found was really a wonderful chance. Just by chance, she walked out of my office and there was a person out there smoking. And she puked right outside of my door. Mm. <laughs> she walked right out, there was cigarette smoke, and she just went, oh, oh yeah. So you have to start giving people uh, air well, sickness bags. Well, her husband came to see me a week later. Mm -hmm. He said, I gotta quit smoking. I don't know what you did, but my wife hasn't touched a cigarette in a week, but I come in the house, she says she could smell cigarettes on me, and she just <laughs> starts getting sick. Uh, and I feel so bad, I have gotta quit smoking too. Uh, what, can you, what can you do? I'm like, well, yes, you have to quit smoking too, because her mind has so decided. And I actually had a chance to run into her now, 22 years later, she still does not smoke. Oh, great. How about that? That's How is really that nice. strong where the coming together yeah. of those two parts of the brain with suggestion. So her subconscious desires and her conscious desires became one and the same. And That's to great. me, that is absolutely fabulous. Now, have any graduates of uh, your courses, have they stayed in touch with you? Do you know anything about what they're up to? Do you have students that are continuing with hypnosis and what is yeah what's really interesting with uh, the courses here especially at the ARE mm -hmm. is we have people come in and I have students who are I have psychiatrists who have come in mm -hmm. I have Jungian therapists who come in I have social workers who come in I have licensed practicing counselors who come in I have teachers come in I have nurses come in I have people who just got their GED and don't know what to do who have come in and from there become life coaches to other people. Mm -hmm. So the really interesting thing is this whole broad spectrum of training is available to people from all these different walks of life and they find out they can apply it to all of that. So I do find, and these people come in, and especially those in nursing or in dental care, one of the stories that was related to me was one of my students was a dental assistant. And she came back and said that she had a gentleman, and he turned out really interesting guy because he was a t Marine, tough guy, but he also was allergic to anesthesia. Mm. He could not have anesthesia. Mm. So for his dental work, she taught him a pain control technique that we taught in class on how to make his, uh, uh, um, his hand go numb. And he learned to make his hand numb and from there to take a hand once that is and to take that analgesia and pass it on mm. so that he could actually get dental work done and not have to mentally be there. So they yeah. find that they can apply it not just in the people think therapy. Well, no, not just in therapy. She was able to apply it to dentistry. 
mm -hmm. and to apply, apply it just to that day-to-day -day kind of work. And I know people who have said they actually, they took the courses and they learned how to use hypnosis and they just use it to help their kids with test anxiety. Go ahead. So they apply it to just their day-to-day -day lives. So it's a little, it goes, it's a full spectrum of how they apply it. Well, amplify that because I, uh, some of the folks who are watching or listening are thinking about taking your course. Yeah. And what would they, after they complete the course, what, what sort of things would they be able to do? Like how could they take it out and apply it in their practices or begin well, a practice? First of all, you're going to learn the controlled use of language. Mm -hmm. One of the f first things I bring to a person's attention is the danger of the word. I want you to know this. K-N-O-W. Mm -hmm. I want you to know this. And we say this so often. Uh, Did it you gets know? confused with no, with, N-O. Yeah, no, yeah. N-O, N-O. Yeah. And they hear no. And when you look at people's response times in cognitive psychology, no takes longer to process. Mm. So when you tell somebody, I want you to know this, mm. it takes them longer than saying, I want you to remember and recall. But on the controlled use of day-to-day -day language, altered state open to suggestion. How many times have you been out shopping and you've seen a child who's in trouble, okay? In trouble with their parent. And they're sitting there looking up at their parent because they're in trouble. Think that's an altered state? Mm -hmm. You bet that's an altered state. And I point out to parents how important that moment is. Because so many kids, so many teenagers, they're in that altered state of, oh no, what now? And the parent goes, you don't listen to me. How powerful of a suggestion is that? <laughs> you don't listen to me. So they just reinforce the behavior they don't want. And they don't listen. Mm -hmm. And they don't realize people, their intention is something completely different, but they're not in control of their words. So the words that they're teaching others are of a negative behavior and they get it in abundance. And in reality, the application of these techniques that we teach means when you're in that point, the thing you say to that child who's altered in their consciousness is you're smarter than that. You're smarter than that. Mm -hmm. Learning is so easy. Mm -hmm. I expect yes. a better grade out of you. Yeah. I expect an A. This is something you can do. And to take that word out. And anybody watching this, I challenge you for the next week, take the word no out of your vocabulary. Just take it out completely. Yeah. And just see what happens. Yeah, and they're finding that not, not just with parenting, but then in, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. that it's up to six uh, positive statements that a team that you receive versus one corrective. That it, yeah. you tune it in. You start, otherwise, if, if everything's kind of negative, you start to screen it out. Like I remember my mom would do that. Like yeah. I knew that if she started complimenting me, I was in trouble. Like she'd say, how, can, coming, she'd yeah. say, how can such a smart boy, so mm -hmm. kind, and you know, that I said, mm -hmm. oh, what I do? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing I always laughed, about, laughed at in the help, they made a joke about it, but you know you're kind, you're smart, and you're important. Mm -hmm. it goes a long way. Yeah. It's a very powerful powerful yeah. thing because then you, you feel like you're here and that your 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 natural state is here yeah. and you've just acted from this place and it's confusing you know the worst thing is when you tell a kid oh you're no good or you're you'll never amount to anything like you said you're programming that into the child al franken made a career out of the out of making jokes of people's behavior mm -hmm. good senator now and in the 80s his character stuart smalley i remember yeah okay and he'd always end it with this pseudo therapy <laughs> voice and gosh darn it people like you mm -hmm. The irony is that actually does work. Mm -hmm. That's the whole irony yeah. of that, is it really does work. And when you talk about the number of compliments, when I do relationship counseling and I teach courses on relationships, when it comes to communication, when couples first start dating, the positive experience to negative experiences, there's 10 positive experiences for every negative experience. Mm -hmm. And people got to realize that's not just in dating. It's the same when you get a job. When you first go to work, it's 10 positive experiences, maybe one negative, and you love your job. When people are divorcing, the ratio is 0.8 
to one. Hmm. So point eight positive experience is not even a full positive experience to a negative experience. Mm -hmm. And I'll make a bet if you've ever quit a job, you found the same thing. The moment you walked in, the first suggestion you give yourself when you walk into work is, oh, another, another day. day. Yeah. Instead of going, it's going to be a great day. It's going to be a good day. And if you start with a smile and a positive, it becomes a positive. Mm -hmm. So you just give a suggestion to smile. What's really amazing, that combination of suggestion in the brain. Mm -hmm. If you smile and you give a suggestion, just smile, smile, smile. If you smile long enough, and I, I get my students to do this, just make me a yeah. big cheesy smile. Just a big cheesy smile, just a all real the, big smile. And, you get that. and eventually, you start giggling. Mm -hmm. Because if you smile long enough, your frontal lobe will tell you why you're laughing. Same thing if you frown long enough, you'll yeah. find something to be sad about. Yeah. It's changing that orientation that you can take the same. This is why in one of my areas of research is post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. With PTSD, you've got two people who will go through the same experience. One person has this elevation of endorphins and this elevation of cortisol and all of these emotions coming in. One person goes, this is great, this is exciting. One person says, this is terrifying. Well, the person who says it's great is fine. The one who says it's terrifying has PTSD. And one of the keys, and this is where hypnosis comes in, and hypnosis, I think, takes on a much more serious importance, is when you look at the number of people who are coming back right now from overseas with post-traumatic stress disorder, and they talk about, well, part of me is still there. I still feel like I'm there. Mm -hmm. And when they were in that altered state, the suggestion they gave themselves, this happens to people who are rape victims, this happens to people who are combat veterans, this inner statement that seems to be so strongly linked with post-traumatic stress is, I'm dead. Not that I'm gonna mm. die here, the suggestion mm. they gave themselves was, mm. I'm already dead. Oh. So they come back and it's no wonder all these movies and TV shows about zombies are so popular, because mm. they come back from the dead. Mm. And that's also the beauty of it. See, hypnosis, self-hypnosis trauma is from this auto-hypnotic model where they put themselves into this state and they took a negative suggestion inside. It's also the way out to put them back into that altered state and give a positive suggestion to fix it and make them whole and find their way back out. And that goes from being a five-year-old kid being called, you don't listen and you're stupid, to a person who was over in combat or a person who was held down against their will to go back, and this is the beauty of hypnosis, you can go back and talk to yourself at that time in regression. Go back yeah. to when you were five years old yeah. and you got that bad you get message. outside of time. And you can give from that regression that positive message and learn yeah. it from there. Yeah. I first discovered this with smoking, trying to get people to quit smoking, mm -hmm. which is so much more. Now, Dr. Joyce Lynn Elders, when she was our Surgeon General, said that giving up cigarettes and giving up heroin were in the same class. Mm -hmm. It's that difficult. Mm -hmm. And you see people now who go, well, I don't smoke anymore. I just vape. Nicotine. They're still stuck on the drug. Yeah. But what I found was just amazing with hypnosis, where the coming together of science and that, that spiritual is to regress them back to that moment when they first had a cigarette. And I'll have them regress back and they'll go, oh, well, I was 15 and, you know, I'm in the bleachers behind the high school football game and, you know, everybody's hacked. I thought I'll have a cigarette. I'm like, back up one more day, that day when you were still a non-smoker. Let's talk to that part of you. Let's talk to that reflection of your consciousness. Let's talk to that you. Now let's get that person to agree to never smoke. Now let's let take that line of your consciousness back to today. And now there's a part of your brain that realizes, I've never smoked. Same thing. Now that's a, that's a, a minor thing. It's a mm -hmm. little thing. But I find when you work with people who have a larger trauma, 
you give them that same kind of suggestion to recall who you were before. Can we bring that forward now? And can you make friends with and make an agreement with that hurt you? And then bring that healed individual forward. And from there you get this massive change. A new perspective. That whatever that thing was, was a learning experience. And sometimes, you know, the best thing we can learn from an experience is, I don't ever want to do that again. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been... Uh... We have so many um, similar uh, connections. And yeah. then I remember the, the time we got to teach together. That was that, uh, fantastic to yeah. be able to blend the two styles yeah. and to combine them together. Yeah. Well, and that's, I think, in summary, one of the beautiful things about what we're doing here when I talk about foundations is that we, we start with a foundation where we talk about suggestion. We talk about the beginnings of how to do a regression. Mm -hmm. So we talk about all the kinds of suggestions you can do for self-esteem, changing who you are, lowering your stress, to starting to regress back and mentally look at your previous life in mm -hmm. this life or even beyond mm -hmm. and to see how those experiences reflect on your current life. Well, at the next level, we look at the deepening techniques of working with yeah. one's inner child yeah. and one's fragmented self and yeah. how to put the fragmented self back together. And then we start combining that with Casey and Casey's view on past lives and how another layer, how that blends together with those. Mm -hmm. So by the time I think a person has gone through all of our courses, they have this robust bust level of training of, of what, 200 hours mm -hmm. of actual training, which I don't think you're going to find anywhere else. Yeah. That where we have two therapists with as much experience as we have and much teaching experience bringing our skills together. Yeah. Well, so much, you know, the, the, the whole, you know, Casey's work is based on hypnosis. You know, it was yeah. under hypno hypnotic trance that he, he did everything he does. So it's, it seems to me like it's a natural fit to be exploring yeah. hypnosis. And I bring this out to people. ARE. It's the natural state though. We go through that hypnoidal state every night when we mm -hmm. fall asleep and yeah. every day when we wake up. Yeah. We go through that hypnoidal state to where we are in that dream state. And I like to remind people that they've already worked with the hypnoidal state because I'll make a bet when they were a teenager, they went up to their mom or dad when they were laying there on the couch and go, is it okay if I stay out all night tonight? And they go, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Well, that was an altered state. It was mm -hmm. the hypnoidal state. And they were open to suggestion. But what we can also do is once you realize you're in that hypnoidal state yourself, you can tell yourself who you want to be that day. Mm -hmm. What do you want to accomplish that day? Mm -hmm. In what direction you want to move on? So you can use that natural hypnoidal state. Now, now when, did, when did you... Um find out about Edgar Casey. Like had you already begun working with hypnosis and then you, you connected Back with Edgar even Casey? For, I grew up I grew up with the readings. Oh okay. My my mother was a member of uh, Casey study groups oh. back in the nineteen fifties and the nineteen oh, sixties okay. and she had, had her own study group. Oh I didn't know so, that. So yeah, so it's interesting because I'm here at the ARE I find a lot of people who have been in the the scientific kind of allopathic world mm -hmm. discovering Casey and Casey's remedies. Well, I was always a flake. Mm -hmm. I grew up as a flake. Mm. And I learned science to help support my flakiness. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so well, it's like, like hypnosis work is kind of the bridge between science and spirituality. It's it like is. A, it crosses over. It's kind of in the middle there. It is in the middle there, and I think mm -hmm. that's what's wonderful, because people who don't believe in the spirituality at all will go into hypnosis, and they will tell their client, go to the cause of the problem. Now the client may or may not believe in a past life. The therapist may or not believe that there's a past life. But if the subconscious believes that the problem is in a past life, that's exactly where the subconscious is going to yeah. take you. And then it just consciousness is such a, a small part of the totality of consciousness. What we you are. Know, what we, so I think that, that the subconscious does its work 
and then the little you know, uh, tip of the iceberg, which is this waking consciousness. Yeah. All that work gets done, and the little, the little tip says, well, I don't know how it happened, but it happened. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. But it's almost like so much of what we do is subconscious. You know, we, we don't, we're not in charge of our digestion. You know, that's a subconscious process. And so there's even all these, this, like I, I always say oftentimes that the psyche naturally works to heal itself if mm -hmm. we just kind of access it. I think one of the things that I really believe that hypnotic technique in understanding our states of consciousness should be taught at every level. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about elementary school, high school, we should be taught about our levels of consciousness. When people go on road trips, now right now it's recommended it, um, if you have our AAA, this is right out of the AAA manual, every three and a half hours get out of your car and stretch your legs. Mm -hmm. And they talk about that with blood clots in your legs, but also the road and the movement of signs is like a hypnodrome. Mm -hmm. And I love asking people, how many times have you driven home from work and you're talking to yourself and that conversation in your head with yourself is so loud that you go, oh, I'm home. And you don't even recognize or realize you had driven home. Mm -hmm. Oh because, yeah, yeah, so you're, yeah and, and you meant to stop somewhere on the way oh, home, yeah, but you, you, go, automatically, you, up, you yeah. automatically take your automatic normal pilot. turn and you automatically yeah, drive. What am I doing? Yeah, because you know, in the yeah. middle, when we learn how to drive, it's like 10 and two, 10 and two, but mm -hmm. you know, as you're older, it's just all automatic processing. Yes. But another thing, to, way to say automatic processing is subconscious processing. So your subconscious drives you home every day. So people don't realize that they go in that hypnotic state every day. They go into that every day and they're already doing it. So what we're gonna do is teach you when you are in hypnotic states and how to control them for your own better personal growth. And that's not scary at all. Good, and then um one, one last thing we've talked about that I just want to make a plug for is that we've talked about having a symposium here on hypnosis. And so I just want to, perhaps we'll end with that, that we're hoping, hoping to build that someday here, that we can become a, a center for uh, you know, bringing uh, continuing education yeah. in the field yeah. of hypnosis and regression. Everything Edgar Cayce did was in hypnotic trance. He put himself in a self-hypnotic trance. And I really believe that the ARE should be in the forefront of hypnosis and hypnosis training and a chance for our graduates yeah. from all of these programs and courses to come back, to interact, mingle, and share their stories. Well, a symposium like that yeah. would be a powerful thing. Let's make it happen. Growth. Well, thanks Let's so much for coming. Thank you. It's been a great uh, okay, conversation. Fantastic. Got to know a lot more about you. Anytime. Hope I'm really excited. I'm excited Soon. working with you again. Yeah, sure thing. Excellent. Right, look great. forward to your course uh, coming in March. It'll be fun. Thank you. It'll be fun. Okay, great. Hello and welcome once again. This is Peter Woodbury and we have the thought for today. We've got Pat Belisle and he's going to read us and give us some commentary on his thought for the day. Hey, Pat, how are you? I'm very well, Peter. I hope you are. Uh, I have uh, a wonderful reading here today. It is reading number 2537-1, and it's a short one, which is also good and understandable, which isn't always the case. Mm -hmm. It says, know the first principles. There is good in all that is alive. And wow, I, I sure appreciate that because I, I grew up uh, spending a lot of time in nature and uh, you'll see things in nature that are like, why is that ugly bug alive in this world? Or, you know, mosquitoes or, or whatever it is, uh, let alone people or, or, or things going on in your life. But this reading, I think, is very reaffirming that, uh, that really every living thing has a purpose and is, has good. So I appreciate knowing that. It's reassuring. How about you? Yeah, I remember um, back when I started my career as a social worker, I had to work a lot with um, folks that were court mandated. And sometimes I'd read these records, you know, and I'd think, oh my gosh, you know, who is this person? And then oftentimes when I'd meet them, you know, it was like the, there's so much more to a person than, you know, any single thing. And so I found that there was humanity in, uh, in everyone I had to work with. And so that's, that's what it's reminding me of, that there is indeed, what's that saying? There's, there's good in the best of us and bad in you know, all of us. And so I oftentimes think there's, nothing's all good and nothing's all bad. It's all, we're all kind of working through uh, 
trying to improve ourselves day by day. It's true. Even though I have all these spiritual symbols behind me, I don't have a yin and yang. But when you were talking about that, it made me think about, you know, the, the half that's black has a little dot of white and mm-hmm. the half that's white has a little dot of black. So, yeah, there's there's good in everything and there's probably <laughs> some darkness even in the light. But yeah. 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 Great. Great. All right. Thank you, Pat. You bet. Take care.